Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Heritage Foundation's president, Kay Coles James. You know, they call that the voice of God when you're introduced by an off-camera person, but I never knew it was a woman. Hello, Genevieve. Where are you? Welcome. We are so delighted to be, for you to be here today and so excited about what this day represents. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this special occasion releasing the Index of Economic Freedom, our 25th edition. Who was here for the first? Look at that. Well, thank you for being here for the 25th, and we look forward for uh, you celebrating with us as we move forward. For 45 years, the Heritage Foundation has been dedicated to building an America where freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society flourish. For those of us who have the privilege of working here at the Heritage Foundation, that is not a throwaway line. In fact, it's our battle cry against the forces of oppression and tyranny. You see, for literally thousands of years, the vast majority of people lacked economic freedom and opportunity. And as a result, they were condemned to demeaning, dehumanizing lives of poverty, sickness, and in many cases, early death. A few people controlled most of the power and most of the wealth, and pretty much everyone else suffered. Thankfully, those days are over for more people today than at any previous time in all of human history. But we still see instances such as Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and North Korea that serve as a stark reminder of where we've come from. And in fact, where we could return if we don't remain dedicated to building a better future. That's what the Heritage Foundation is all about and committed to. Also, that's why our index of economic freedom is so important now more than ever. The index of economic freedom is unique it's a team-spirited flagship product of the Heritage Foundation, and its creation involves nearly everyone in this building, but there are a few that I want to especially thank for their work on this year's index. Ambassador Terry Miller, Anthony Kim, Jim Roberts, Jim Carafano, Jack Spencer, Bill Poole, Teresa Penfeather, and John Fleming, and Jay Simon. Thank you all so much for the incredible work that you do. It is a phenomenal product, and it really does speak into uh, our dialogue on these very important issues. The index chronicles the advance of economic freedom and its conquest of poverty with detailed analysis presented in a user-friendly format, the index has served as the go-to resource for policymakers, researchers, and students for more than 20 years. The index confirms the essential link between free markets and prosperity, and it has absolutely inspired policy change around the globe, improving the lives of millions of people. The 25 years of data we have amassed in this project demonstrates conclusively that economic freedom leads to better health, longer lives, improved education, and cleaner environments. It expands markets and raises living standards, and it brings societies closer together in peaceful commercial cooperation that transcends race, religion, and culture. In sum, the index reveals a powerful truth. Governments that respect and promote openness and free markets make their citizens' lives and the world better. The ratings and rankings will undoubtedly change in the future. We hope for the better in all countries everywhere. 
But one thing will not change. However, um, the one thing that will not change is the fundamental message of the index. As we at Heritage said in introducing the first index in 1995, in striving for peace and prosperity, freedom is what counts most. And now I would like to invite Dr. Kim Holmes, Executive Vice President of the Heritage Foundation, to share how the index has evolved and made measurable impact around the globe. Perhaps most notably for today's special occasion, I should mention that Dr. Holmes was a founding editor of the Index of Economic Freedom. Dr. Holmes. This is James. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, this morning. Uh, it's, uh, I also want to add, Mrs. James, thanks to you, Terry, and Anthony, Jim Roberts, and Jack, uh, and the rest of the team that worked on this stellar product. It's been in my life now for 25 years. Uh, every year it seems to get a bit better, and it's because of these people right here that it's getting better. So thank you very much for, for all your hard work. You know what? These are my children, <laughs> my children's children. And since there's so many of them, my children's children's children. Uh, after 25 years uh, of the Index of Economic Freedom, what a, a wonderful visual. I didn't uh, realize they were going to be doing this. But this is, uh, yeah, this is the one I, we started back in 1995. It was pre-digital, by the way. And so the graphics are rather primitive. But I spent hours uh, with printers trying to make sure that it was working correctly. So we have come a long ways in so many different ways in the index. I remember meeting in Ed Fulner's office uh, 25 years ago, and he asked me if we thought we could produce an index of economic freedom. There was a lot of talk among economists at the time whether or not it could be done. Milton Friedman had called for them. The, the Fraser Institute had been involved in creating uh, an idea for the index. There was a lot of people, a lot of chatter, trying to see if we could do this. And he asked me if I thought that our staff could do it. And I said, sure. You know, we set to work. And the first publication in 1995 was the result. Now, the question is often put to me about why do we decide to do this in the end of the mid-1990s. And there are actually many reasons for it. Uh, one was to offer policymakers a guide to how well foreign aid worked or did not work. Uh, that was the, the topic at the time, and uh, that was sort of the issue that kind of push, pushed us over the edge when we asked ourselves the question, OK, well, you can do a theoretical study like this, but what is the policy payoff? You know, how we're up here on Capitol Hill. Uh, the Heritage Foundation tries to offer solutions to policy questions, and so that was the sort of the issue of entry into making that final decision. But actually, though, thinking back, the biggest reason we decided to do it uh, was that the Cold War had ended and freedom was breaking out all over the planet. Much of the talk at the time, though, as a result of this, was about political freedom, about democracy, and about elections, all of which are, of course, very good, but which were only part of the picture. Uh, we knew that as communist dictators were falling, uh, we were discovering, many people were discovering the benefits of the free market, of capitalism. And we wanted to create a research product to give policymakers, uh, professors, economists, uh, a benchmark for measuring economic policy and progress towards prosperity. The 25th edition of the index marks an especially important milestone. Many more countries are committed to a free market policies today than they were 25 years ago. The results have been far better quality of life for millions of people around the globe. And after 25 years of measuring global economic freedom, the verdict is in. Economic freedom leads to rapid increases in incomes, dramatic drops in poverty, sustainable gains in education, health, and environment, and also the improved conditions for democracy and peaceful cooperation among neighbors. It's just basically the foundation for so many other things peace, democracy, and freedom. 
This year's index also points to a welcome positive trend for the United States. Following an ambitious tax reform push by the Trump administration and also strong deregulatory agenda, the United States has moved up six places from last year's ranking and is now in the top 15 countries ranking in the index. This improvement reverses a depressing downward trend in the United States scores that been, had been happening in the previous years. This progress is especially important to remember as some Americans want to return the clock backwards on economic freedom. If they succeed, we will not only lose the progress on economic freedom, but also the strides made in economic growth over the past two years here in the United States. But not only that, we would lose the improvements of standards of living that accompanies growth and accompanies economic freedom. When governments do a little less, they can empower their people to do so much more, unleashing powerful energies of entrepreneurship and effort. You know, it's not the massive redistribution of wealth mandated by government on wages, on prices that make the lives, not only of Americans, but anybody better. Instead, lower barriers for people to enter the market increases social and economic mobility, giving rise to higher standards of living. It's not mandates by the government for green energy that will solve our many environmental challenges. Rather, it is economic freedom, actual government deregulation in the marketplace that leads to higher levels of technological innovation and also to the economic dynamism that helps keep our environment clean. Now, we should be happy with the progress, Mrs. James referred to this in her remarks, that have been made over the past 25 years. You hear so much uh, gloom and doom uh, in the world today, and yet the story of economic freedom and economic development is one of success. When the index first was launched, nearly a third of the world was living in poverty. In 2019, less than 10% can say the same. Incomes have risen, innovation has flourished, and prosperity continues to grow for hundreds, tens of millions and hundreds of millions of people around the globe. Now, there are dark storms uh, and clouds on the horizon, uh, but there is no economic challenge which cannot be solved by free market solutions. So over the past 25 years, uh, the mission of the index has grown far beyond the initial goal to identify and to measure conditions conducive to foreign aid, as I mentioned earlier. But one of the reasons why the index has fared so well, as Alan Greenspan once said about the Index of Economic Freedom, is because its findings conform to economic reality. In other words, this is not just about theory, it's about results and measuring results. The index is truly a remarkable showcase of the progress the world has made since the fall of socialism, which was the original reason why we started it. It is a guiding light for those who seek to revive all of those dangerous policies and to learn from history that you should not repeat them. Uh, I just hope that uh, the last thing I can say here on the 25th anniversary uh, to all of my children here is that I hope 25 years from now they are still around. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Terry Miller. I'm the um, uh, senior editor, I guess is the right way to put it, of the Index of Economic Freedom. And it's going to be my privilege um, to talk to you about the actual results of the index this year. Um, and I'll be using a little bit of data to do that, but I'll try to make it as uh, much fun as we possibly can. Uh, we've been doing this project now for 25 years, uh, as you've heard many times this morning. And you can see on the right side of this graph uh, that the uh, progress of economic freedom has been significant over that time. 
Uh, now there's a little bit of a glitch there at the end of that graph, and uh, you can see that we actually lost economic freedom in the world as a whole this year. Um, but still, the global average score of 60.8 is the third highest we've ever experienced in the index of economic freedom. Uh, so I think the overall trend is still positive. Uh, you've heard a little bit about why we do this, and I just want to emphasize that with some data. Um, the main reason is what you see here in this graph. Economic freedom uh, causes and is highly correlated with higher incomes and greater prosperity. You can see in the graph on the left there that countries, um, as they move up the economic freedom scale, they tend to have much higher levels of per capita income. The numbers are there on the bars on the right side. Uh, you can see that countries that are free, um, as measured in our index, have per capita incomes that are um, almost eight times, I guess, higher than uh, the countries that are considered repressed in the index of economic freedom. Uh, that's an amazing difference. And uh, you can see as the slope of the graph on the left side starts to get quite steep uh, for countries at higher levels of economic freedom, uh, that continued improvements in economic freedom make a real difference in levels of prosperity. Uh, this is true in every region of the world for countries at all levels of development. Uh, you can see the difference between the freest countries in each region and the least free countries in each region on this graph. Uh, you may uh, look at the sub-Saharan um, numbers there and say, wait, that's not true there. But the unfortunate truth is that there are very few countries in sub-Saharan Africa that have even a modest level of economic freedom. So um, only seven countries out of the 49 that we measure in sub-Saharan Africa have um, levels of economic freedom that we would classify as even moderately free. Uh, so there's a very small base there to inform that blue, um, blue column for sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the regions are not consistent um, in their commitment to economic freedom. Uh, the Middle East, Asia Pacific, and the Americas in the middle of this graph, they all have levels of economic freedom that are on average approximately uh, the world average of economic freedom. Uh, but you can see at the top that Europe does significantly better. And at the bottom, um, unfortunately, again, Sub-Saharan Africa lagging significantly behind. Uh, but good news for those countries that are lagging behind, it's not just the level of economic freedom that's important. Uh, there's a very high correlation, a very high relationship between changes in economic freedom and economic growth rates, which of course represent the change in levels of prosperity. And we find that um, whether you're looking at just the past five years, the past 25 years, whatever time frame you look at, countries that have improved their economic freedom have much higher growth rates on average than the countries that uh, have either lost freedom or are stagnant in terms of economic freedom. Uh, this is my very favorite result from the Index of Economic Freedom. You can see that as economic freedom has gone up over the 25 years and the global economy has expanded significantly, poverty rates have been cut by two-thirds. Um, I think this is a message that is lost on uh, the great majority of the population, not only here in the United States, but in countries around the world. Um, the free market capitalist system that's uh, represented and uh, measured by the Index of Economic Freedom um, has created a tremendous increase in prosperity and improved living conditions for literally hundreds of millions of people around the world. Um, and it's not just the number of people living in poverty. Um, it also um, has reduced the intensity of poverty for people in countries. And you can see here that the intensity of poverty in the countries that are mostly free or moderately free in terms of economic freedom is much lower than the intensity of poverty. And that means how is poverty actually experienced by the people in those countries? And it's, um, it's much less 
um, of a deprivation in the countries that have higher levels of economic freedom. Um, and I think you already heard a little bit about this this morning, but um, I also wanted to emphasize that the countries with higher levels of economic freedom, the, the citizens in those countries enjoy much better health, uh, they enjoy higher levels of education, they do a much better job in protecting the environment. It's not these big status solutions, government-directed central planning projects that result in improvements in social well-being, but rather increases in economic freedom. Um, and this shows the relationship between the index of economic freedom and two uh, major indicators, global indicators of social well-being. The, the relationships on the left uh, show the Human Development Index put out by the UN Development Program. And you can see that countries that are free enjoy high levels of economic freedom, have much higher levels of human development. And the index, um, uh, the graph on the right shows the comparison between economic freedom scores and the social progress index put out by the Social Progress Initiative. Um, and again, countries that have higher levels of economic freedom have much higher levels of social progress overall. I did promise I'd get to the results, and here they are. Um, in the 2019 Index of Economic Freedom, we have six economies that have earned the designation as free, uh, economically free economies. And I just want to mention each one um, individually. Hong Kong um, is number one in the index this year and um, deserves an incredible amount of credit um, under very trying, uh, sometimes political uh, circumstances. Hong Kong has maintained its number one position in the index all 25 years we have been measuring economic freedom. Number two in the index this year is Singapore. And uh, number three, New Zealand. That's a nice picture of Auckland there. Uh, Switzerland, number four. I'm pretty sure that's Zurich. Anybody in the audience confirm that? OK, thank you, yeah. Um, Australia, number five, the Sydney Opera House. Uh, we thought we'd highlight that. And Ireland, number six. So these six countries really deserve the highest praise for achieving um, significant levels of economic freedom. And I, I think you would see, uh, if you looked at the economic indicators, that all of them are doing quite well indeed in terms of uh, promoting prosperity for their citizens. <coughs> Uh, I wanted also to highlight the regional champions. Uh, some of these are repeats from the top six list. Uh, Hong Kong, of course, in Asia. Uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, had the highest scores in the Middle East, North Africa region. And Mauritius was the leader in Sub-Saharan Africa. I also want to give a little shout out to Rwanda, uh, which had the highest economic freedom scores on the African, um, the Sub-Saharan African continent itself. <laughs> Uh, and joined the ranks of the mostly free countries this year uh, for the first time ever. Um, oops, I left out to Ireland, of course, in Europe, and Canada had the highest level of economic freedom um, in the Americas. It really pains me to say that as a citizen of the United States. Um, I would very much like the United States to be on top of this index, and that's something we're very hard, um, working very hard here at the Heritage Foundation to try to achieve. A um, couple of things about this list. Uh, the, um, this shows the top 20 scores in our index this year and also the bottom 20 scores in the index. Uh, there are two significant movers on the left side of this uh, in the top 20. Um, unfortunately, one is downward, and that's Estonia, uh, which fell significantly this year in the index. And that was the result primarily of a banking crisis and scandal that afflicted that country. Um, the other movement was a little more positive, and that's the movement of the United States, which had the biggest jump among the leaders in economic freedom, moving from 18th place up to 12th place in the index. On the other side of the graph, uh, there aren't very many happy stories to tell. Um, and I think I would just highlight Venezuela. 
uh, there at the near the bottom of the graph in 179th place uh, because you've all probably heard the news stories of the last several days about the turmoil that's engulfing that country. Uh, when we first started measuring economic freedom uh, 25 years ago, Venezuela had one of the higher scores in the index. Uh, their score at that time was around 60 on our index, and now it's 35 points lower, um, and they've sunk to near last place, and um, the result is, as you see in the news, um, societal chaos and deprivation for the citizens of that um, country. I also wanted to highlight the country leaders in each of our categories uh, that we measure in the index. We measure 12 categories of economic freedom now. Uh, you can see that Singapore was the leader in property rights and judicial effectiveness, and uh, New Zealand the leader in government integrity. Uh, this is a particularly important category, these rule of law categories, for the developing countries, actually, because they lag seriously behind um, in terms of rule of law, whereas the more developed countries like Singapore and New Zealand, for example, tend to score very high on these indicators. Government size is led by three developing countries. Uh, Saudi Arabia, with its oil revenue, has the lowest tax burden in the world, and Sudan has the lowest level of government spending. And now, if we were talking about a developed country like the United States, I would um, be among the first to praise that low level of government spending. Uh, for a country like Sudan, I'm afraid it may just mean they don't have the capability uh, to um, provide any services at all at the governmental level. But nonetheless, they um, led the index in government uh, spending measures this year. And fiscal health, though, the top of the charts was Macau. And uh, I think that's probably due to the um, extreme amount of gaming revenue that they um, are able to achieve in the government that allows them to have a balanced budget. <coughs> Regulatory efficiency um, is a category that um, is equally important, I would say, for countries at all levels of development. Hong Kong led in business freedom and Singapore in labor freedom. Uh, Bulgaria, which made an early decision after, its, um, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the lifting of the Iron Curtain to adopt a monetary board uh, to make the uh, decisions about currency independent of political considerations, uh, tops the world in monetary freedom. And finally, open markets. Um, this is uh, one of the most interesting categories. It's also one of the categories where we have the absolutely best data. Uh, that we, It's always a challenge to find worldwide data for the index. Uh, Hong Kong with essentially zero tariffs, uh, no tariffs at all. Imagine what that looks like, no tariffs. Um, leads the world in trade freedom. And Luxembourg, which has um, probably the highest per capita income of any country in the world uh, leads the world in investment freedom. And I think there's a clear relationship there. Their per capita income now is well over $100,000. Uh, so uh, think about the uh, level of prosperity that those citizens um, enjoy. And then for financial freedom, it's um, led by Australia, Hong Kong, and Switzerland. That means all those countries have very high levels of competition in the banking sector, and uh, competition breeds efficiency and helps lower prices. I also want to give a shout out to uh, countries that have done particularly well in the index this year. Um, overall, Barbados uh, had the highest improvement in economic freedom. They actually jumped 50 places in the index this year. <laughs> Uh, from 117th last year to 67th this year. And that improvement was due almost entirely to the fact that they got their fiscal situation under control. Um, they reduced their government spending, they balanced their budget, um, and they put their country on a sound fiscal uh, situation. Uh, most improved in rule of law was Azerbaijan, probably not a country many of you have even heard of. Uh, but a country that's moving up very fast in our index of economic freedom. And um, they improved in all three categories of rule of law, property rights, uh, judicial effectiveness, and um, government integrity, and um, had the best improvement overall in rule of law. 
Uh, government size, as I've already talked about, uh, Barbados had uh, the largest improvement in that category um, due, again, to getting their fiscal situation into balance. The most improved country in open markets was Laos, and uh, this was in due entirely to their trade freedom score. Uh, they dropped their applied tariffs uh, from 14% on average last year uh, to just a little over 1% this year. So they've practically eliminated their tariffs, and uh, that makes them the most improved country in the index of economic freedom in terms of open markets. Um, regulatory efficiency, this is an interesting case. The Republic of Congo is uh, really in no way a good performer in our index, and they have very low level of uh, per capita income and uh, very low levels of prosperity. Uh, nonetheless, they improved, um, they showed improvements in all three categories of regulatory efficiency. They improved their business regulations, their labor regulations, uh, their monetary freedom. And uh, that gives me some hope that we will see some improvement, uh, some social improvement, some economic improvement in that country in the years ahead. And finally, I wanted to highlight this list of countries. This um, is a 25-year graph, covers the entire history of our index. And this shows the countries that have made the most improvement over time in the index of economic freedom. Uh, most of these countries have improved by um, 20 or even 30 points in their index scores over the years. Um, and they all are the, um, the countries to watch, to watch out for in terms of good economic performance going forward. And I really wanted to take this opportunity to mention all of them by name, Georgia, Lithuania, uh, Rwanda, which I already talked about a little bit, Bulgaria, Romania, Armenia, Albania, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Serbia, Cabo Verde, Samoa, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, and Montenegro. Um, one other thing about this list, you don't really see any Latin American countries on this list. Um, and you'll see, um, if you look at our index, and I assume you've all picked up um, copies of our index now, uh, we have sections focusing on each region of the world individually. And I invite you to take a look uh, particularly closely at the section dealing with Latin America, because um, I think there's some interesting conclusions that can be drawn by the relative stagnation in economic freedom in that region. Um, a final shout out to the importance of trade. Uh, and I think my colleague Jack Spencer, who's going to follow me, wanna, may want to talk about this a little bit as well. Um, the decline in economic freedom in the index of economic freedom this year was driven by two categories, really. One was judicial effectiveness. And uh, that's a category that uses a lot of survey data. And the major declines in that category showed up in Eastern Europe, countries like Poland, uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, which showed declines in judicial effectiveness, are the, the opinion of their citizens about the judicial effectiveness in those countries. Um, the other global indicator that declined significantly was trade freedom. Uh, and I think uh, you all have probably noticed the news about the increased protectionist tendencies in countries around the world, uh, and even here in the United States, and, and we certainly picked that up in the Index of Economic Freedom. And you can see here uh, the importance of trade. Uh, the countries that are judged free in the Index of Economic Freedom um, both depend on and benefit from trade much more highly than um, do the countries that are unfree or repressed. The results of our index have gone up online. Uh, the entire text of the index, all of our databases are online, available at heritage.org slash index. Um, and we can also provide uh, even more data if you contact us uh, directly. Um, at heritage.org. So uh, we're happy to have people use this data. It's freely available. Uh, there's no gateway here or anything like that. Uh, so um, 
we, we have found over the years that researchers uh, pay a lot of attention to the results and um, we try to make them as freely available as possible. And now I'm going to invite my colleague Jack Spencer up to the podium. Jack is the um, vice president in charge of the Institute for Economic Freedom here at the Heritage Foundation. He's going to talk a little bit about the uh, United States and maybe what it would take to get us back into the top 10 or, or dare I say it, number one? Yes. Uh, Jack Spencer. Thank you, Terry. Dr. Holmes and Mrs. James, thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for being here today. This is an exciting day for us here at Heritage and for me personally. <clears throat> As the Vice President for the Institute of Economic Freedom, I hold dear the principles articulated by the index, and I'm honored to be part of the release today. The Index of Economic Freedom is an important document. Literally, people from around the world look forward to our findings each and every year. They wait with anticipation for a reason. What the index measures under the umbrella of economic freedom are 12 variables that provide a very real life assessment of the economic health and vitality of each and every nation. So folks are proud when they're listed high on the, on the list, and they should be. Similarly, they're concerned when they drop, and they should be. The United States is no exception. Over the past 13 years, except for 2016, the US has been on a downward trajectory. In 2010, our, index, our economy was graded as mostly free and the U.S. fell out of the top 10. Our economy was weighed down by high corporate taxation, overbearing regulation, and high levels of government spending. The toll these policies took on the economy were not just theoretical. We had less choice in health care, less choice in banking and finance. Capital was harder to access. We had less money in our pockets as economic growth slowed, and we were forced to buy things we didn't want, and there were fewer jobs. When I think about it, how we only dropped to 18 is really quite a miracle. But then, with the election of Donald Trump, things began to change. The regulatory burden began to ease. In fact, when it comes to significant rules, those that cost over $100 million a year, the Trump administration issued 65% fewer than the Obama administration and 51% fewer than the Bush administration. And it's not just about regulating less, but the president is actually deregulating. In 2018, the administration took 57 significant deregulatory actions compared to 14 significant regulatory actions. By going after CAFE standards, the Clean Power Plan, by protecting the internet freedom, and giving consumers more health care options, this administration is directly increasing the economic freedom of each and every American. Tax reform was implemented. Now we have competitive corporate rates, fewer loopholes, and lower individual rates. And economic growth, real economic growth, has begun to take hold. And we see this progress in the index, as we've heard today. This year, the ranking of the United States is finally on the rise. As we've already heard, the US moved from a low of 18th last year to 12th this year. Now that's good, but it's not good enough. No one is out there chanting, we are number 12, we are number 12. <laughs> now, number 12 is better, to be sure. But why aren't we number one? Or at least in the top 10? I mean, maybe that should be our goal for next year. Let's get the United States into the top 10 of the Index of Economic Freedom. Now, of course, we shouldn't strive to increase our rankings simply based on pride. We should increase, to increase our rankings because of the real world tangible benefits. The index over 25 years has shown, without exception or doubt, that the more economic freedom society has, the healthier it is, the cleaner its environment, the higher its member standards of living. You name the measure if it's good, basically it increases if you get economic, more economic freedom. And basically it goes down as freedom is reduced. The statistics bear this out. As economic freedom has increased over the past 25 years, as we've heard today, Global poverty has been reduced by two-thirds. Human development, including indicators such as infant mortality and lit literacy rates, have increased by nearly 20%. And since 20 2007, entrepreneurial dynamism has increased nearly 15%. What this tells us is that politicians don't have to worry about economic growth. If you have economic freedom, you get economic growth. They don't need to worry about the environment. You get economic freedom, your environment will be cleaner. They don't need to worry about entrepreneurship, investment, trade flows, prices, or jobs. 
as the index shows, economic freedom gives us each of these things. Yet despite this evidence, economic freedom seems to be under attack. And it's not just from the usual suspects on the left, but from across the political spectrum. Folks want to subsidize wages, restrict trade, tax carbon dioxide. They promise some ambiguous notion of security. And all we have to do is give them a little bit of our economic freedom. But here's the problem. Politicians and special interests use such promises to attract our trust while they empower themselves and grow the size and scope of government. Over time, we end up ceding too much power over life's most basic decisions to bureaucrats in Washington. But the truth is, they can never deliver on any of it. To the extent any of their promises are kept, they're fleeing. They come at substantial long-term costs to the rest of us. Look at their promises on clean energy, health care, home ownership. Just never quite works out, does it? And too often, by the time we feel the pain, they're long gone. And the bad policy that benefited some special interest, well, it's cast in stone, and we're stuck with it. This weakens the economy, diminishes opportunity, and it exacerbates the underlying structural problems that they claim to be fixing to begin with. But you see, the market's different. The market's responsive to our needs, because the market is us. That's the magic of the marketplace. You have billions of participants making billions of decisions in real time to advance their dreams, to advance our dreams. And in a free market buttressed by the, the rule of law, no one can do anything without someone else agreeing. We only do things that we believe will advance our visions for ourselves and our families. Sure, people do make bad decisions, but we learn from them and we do less of those things. And we get benefit from the good decisions. And those good decisions add up over time. And that's how we get progress. That's how we leave the caves. We build buggies to move ourselves. That's why I'm able to buy a fancy Belgian chocolate from an iPhone here in Washington, DC. So how does this translate into policy? Well, the index of economic freedom gives us a perfect lens through which to determine whether or not a policy is good or bad. We need merely to ask ourselves, as the index points out, does this action enhance the right of the individual to decide for themselves how to direct their lives? Does it enhance economic freedom? Let's be more specific about how to increase the US ranking. Now on taxes, we got some good tax reform over the past years, but we can do better. A lot of the tax policy in the tax reform has been temporary, so let's make that permanent. Let's establish universal savings accounts for America's middle class. These ac accounts will end the double taxation of our savings of it and investments and allow us to more easily save for the challenges that life throws at us. On regulation, we need to put hard sunsets on new regulation. The economy changes, technology changes, everything changes. We need to be able to reevaluate regulations because they need to change too. And we need to keep the internet free. There's simply no better modern example of the power of free markets than the growth and the success of the internet. And we cannot kill that golden goose. On spending, this one's a big deal. At nearly $22 trillion, America's debt is simply out of control. That's $68,000 for every man, woman, and child in the United States. That exceeds US GDP. The annual deficit will breach a trillion dollars this year. And absent government reforms, it's just going to go up from there. Yet no one seems to care. Democrats spend, Republicans spend, the president spends, Congress spends. Heck, you spend and I spend. The government's created this complex web of dependency, special interests, subsidies, and cronyism, where nearly every person in the United States gets a little cut of the action. So while there, the broad recognition of the larger problem is fairly cliche at this point, the urgency or motivation to do anything about it is nowhere to be found. That needs to change. It has to change now. We need to reform entitlements. Yes, we do need a safety net for those in need. But we're not all in need. And that safety net doesn't have to run so thoroughly through Washington. We need to reduce the size and scope of government. Discretionary spending is not going to be what breaks the government ultimately. But it is what's contributing to the breaking of our free market system. This is where all those little programs that serve this special interest or that special interest live. It's where the regulators get paid. It's where the subsidies get distributed. Together, each of these things, one by one, chips away at America's economic freedom. And then trade. Now, this is the big one looking forward, isn't it? Everyone wants to know, what's President Trump going to do on trade? 
Well, I hate to be so anticlimactic, I have no idea. <laughs> but here's what I do know. There's a lot of opportunity to advance trade. You know, too often we misunderstand the concept. We think about free trade, or about trade as the relationship between countries or governments. We say things like US-China trade policy, or we think of trade as this endeavor between large multinational corporations who are trying to maximize their profits at the expense of the rest of us. But free trade, truly free trade, the ability of an individual to buy from whom or to sell to whom they choose without government intervention anywhere in the world, it's not about any of those things. Free trade is about giving individuals and businesses access to the most resources, products, and markets. It's about increasing quality through competition, making our businesses more competitive and giving them flexibility. It's about creating good jobs and having a market that invites, invites businesses to establish themselves here in the United States. Free trade is about opportunity. Now, for us to continue to move up the rankings, we need to change path. We need to stop with the quotas and tariffs. Look, I get why some folks support these efforts as a way to force actions in other countries. But the fact is that Americans pay for the tariffs, and, we, and everyone suffers. A much better approach is to use organizations like the World Trade Organization to enforce agreed upon trade practices. And if these institutions don't work, then we should strengthen them or come up with ones that do. And finally, we need trade deals that actually advance the freedom to trade. We need to move away from these giant exercises that manage trade through bureaucracies in Washington and that try to harmonize uh, regulations. In closing, a couple of thoughts broadly. When assessing the value of an economic policy, consider the simple question. Does it enhance economic freedom? If it doesn't, then we really need to question the underlying justification for that policy. Now, specifically, when it comes to the United States, we should be happy we've begun moving up in the index rankings. But no one needs to be satisfied with number 12. To continue moving up, we need more tax reform. We need to continue reducing the regulatory burden. We need to reduce federal spending and the impact that spending has on our economy. And we need to rededicate ourselves to advancing the freedom to trade. Thank you for your time. Now, I, th I think we're going to do some questions and answers now, right? That's right. All we right. have uh, a few minutes left, and uh, it's your turn in the audience. Uh, uh, we also have uh, my co-editors, Anthony Kim and uh, Jim Roberts is here somewhere as well. They're for the tough uh, questions. Uh, for the really tough questions. But, uh, let's start right here in the middle. Uh, if you, sorry, if you would wait for a microphone, and uh, also um, if you would, wouldn't mind identifying yourself, uh, we'd appreciate it. Great presentation. Thank you. Preston Knoll with Tradition Family and Property. We, we have seen the jump in the United States from tw 18 to 12. And probably a good part of that is because of President Trump. I think you're right. Uh, we just saw in Brazil the election of the Trump of the tropics, uh, Bolsonaro. And he is promoting the same kinds of ideas that President Trump is. Do you expect Brazil to go from 150 to something a little better? Well, I think I'll take that one. Uh, yes, I would have um, high hopes, actually, that a new regime at, in Brazil could uh, finally get that potential economic powerhouse moving um, in, South, um, in South America. I talked a little bit in my presentation about how um, the countries of Latin America had really lagged behind. Some of them have gone up, down. Um, we've seen a resurgence in some places of uh, sort of socialism or even Peronism. Uh, we've also seen a turn away from that in some countries, and Brazil is one of those. And um, I think the election of someone like Bolsonaro is very um, hopeful uh, for Brazil. So yes, I would, I would look to see them improve their ranking in the future. More? Uh, over here, yes, sir. Uh, wait for the microphone, please. I'm Harry Modin with the United States Department of Defense. Uh, how do you think we can use the U.S. military to uh, advance American economic interests and American economic freedom, uh, particularly at the expense of Russia and China? Hmm. Um, I, I would not say that um, uh, that I see a particular role for the military in advancing economic freedom, although I must say that the U.S. military is a, certainly a positive force in many places around the world when there's a 
tragedy of some kind, uh, a humanitarian disaster or um, a refugee problem, um, the U.S. military um, can do tremendous good works, but that's not the fundamental job of the military. Uh, the fundamental job of the military is to defend the United States and to keep us safe here um, at home. Um, in terms of economic freedom, uh, there's clearly a relationship between um, economic freedom and uh, democracy and certainly peace and stability um, in countries around the world. And um, the U.S. military is often in many places around the world a force for that peace and stability. In that respect, they uh, clearly contribute to the opportunity for economic freedom and, and economic advancement. But um, I would have to reiterate that's not really their main goal. I would just add that one of the really important roles of the military is protecting the, the, the global trade routes and making sure that we have adequate military power such that there's not some regional hegemon that can arise and, and, and impose its will, thus really creating a lot of problems for, econo for, for global economic freedom in those regions. Yeah. Uh, back in the back. Uh, this is James Shane, uh, reporter of Voice of America. I want to ask about the question uh, regarding China. Um, with Xi Jinping, the president, in office, and we've seen the, uh, what's going on in the democracy out there. <laughs> There's no democracy, of course. And also, but we, uh, we've seen those, um, like, uh, many Americans, like, feel disappointed over the years and with the development of the economy, but uh, we've seen the trends are going different way. So uh, how do we understand this uh, trend, like, in terms of this economic freedom? Yeah, well, China had a big burst of economic freedom about 40 years ago now, really at the time of Deng Xiaoping, uh, where their economy was opened up to the world, um, and they benefited enormously from a globalized world economy and their uh, trade relationships and some of the investment relationships they've had. So we've seen per capita income in China grow significantly, but of course from a very low base. Uh, so they still have a very long way to go to catch up in terms of overall prosperity to the countries of um, Europe or the United States, Canada, the, the developed countries in the world. Um, I think it's unfortunate that, that economic reform in China seems to have stalled um, at this point, and the, and the prospects for further reform are certainly, um, I would have to say they're uncertain um, at this point. Uh, we have, of course, this um, very vigorous trade debate and discussion between the United States and China right now. And many of the things that the United States administration is asking China to do are precisely those things that will most benefit the Chinese economy and get reform going again in China. Um, we've seen growth rates slow in China recently. Um, uh, it's really hard to determine exactly what they are. The Chinese government says 6%. Uh, some economists estimate that it's only 1% or 2%, or perhaps even negative at this point in time. Um, but it's absolutely clear that, that China has enormous potential. Uh, they, they only rank 100th in the index of economic freedom. Um, Hong Kong's number one. Taiwan is uh, number 10, I think, this year in the index. Uh, um, clearly, the Chinese people have a great uh, sense uh, for how uh, entrepreneurship works, and um, they can be a very innovative force for the world economy, but that's not happening right now. Um, I think it would be in the best interest of all of us if it did. Um, over here. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Todd Wiggins. My website's called Meet Me DC. So I have a perennial question. I'm sure you can handle this definitely. And that has to do with if you were to spend five minutes with the president, and that means you'd have to give him a succinct plan, what do you think is the biggest problem that the U.S. faces as far as development of, let's say, its manufacturing capabilities, therefore extracting and using its own resources more effectively? And then what would you say would be your prescription to, for solving the problems of the finances in the debt situation that we have. This one's yours. All right. <laughs> um, 
I think on manufacturing, that sort of thing, we just have to have a better business environment. I think we've taken a lot of steps forward, but with um, like full expensing, the, the, that was a big part of uh, tax reform to be able to expense a, 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 bit, a good portion of our business expenses, but it, they were temporary and not as expansive as it should be. So that would be one thing. Continue to drive corporate taxes down or to eliminate them entirely. Um, yeah, what he said. <laughs> um, because all that gets funneled through to, to people anyway. It's a fiction that corporations are taxed at any, at any rate. So those are the sorts of things. And continue to deregulate. And I'm not for just, I'm kind of for broad, just deregulation. But, but, but we have to smart, regulate uh, smartly so that we get rid of these environmental regulations that don't actually help the environment. Um, on debt, look, there are two things. I sort of talked about a little bit in, in the talk. There's the the entitlement stuff. And that's really where our, where our long-term debt liability lies. And we need to get that in, under control. Um, so social security reform is a big one and, and, and all of that stuff. We need to, to reduce those long-term liabilities with some reforms. But in the near term, we need to get the government out of the day-to-day -day lives of our decision-making on the business side. And that's on that discretionary side. Now, like I said, that's not going to break us. But reducing that spending both helps on the long-term debt issue, but also will help us grow the economy more so we can better pay for that stuff over time. Yeah. Uh, down here in front. Thank you. I'm Abdirizak Musa from the Embassy of Kenya. I had two questions. I'm, part of my work here is to attract American investors in, into my country. And we use these indices for that. But we are doing very well under the World Bank Index, which we are number 62. Today, I see we are, doing, we are number 30. So I'll definitely be using the World Bank Index co compared to this. I wanted to see the, the connection. As you, just as you did the comparison with UNDP, Human Development Report, what is the, have you done uh, check why are some countries doing very well in one and not the other one? Number, and then the, another one I was more interested in was the trade freedom. Trade liberalization occurs at many levels, at the WTO level and at the regional level. For African countries, the action now is at the regional level because of the free trade area. So how do you factor in that to determine the index? Do you use the WTO uh, nomenclature alone and the commitments are undertaken or the commitments are undertaken at other levels, like at the regional level? Because most of our trade is expected to occur at the regional level too. Um, well, the index uh, obviously looks at the data for individual countries. Uh, we also do regional analysis, and um, the, the factors you describe are very important. Um, one of the things we're always looking for in the index is, is ways to find better data sources that are comparable among countries so we can look at additional factors um, and make sure that we're uh, handling all those um, in the most efficient and effective way possible. Um, I, I think that um, when we find these high correlations between um, the index of economic freedom, levels of economic freedom, and virtually every other indicator of societal well-being, whether that's eco um, economic well-being, environmental well-being, social well-being, um, this is not an accident. Um, we're finding um, that these factors, it's, it's a little hard to determine the causality um, of, of change in every case. Uh, we don't know whether uh, democracy comes before economic freedom, although uh, from my own point of view, something like economic freedom, which empowers individuals in a society, economic freedom is all about dispersing power, um, both within a society and among societies around the world. I think that's a tremendous force for democracy and uh, respect for human rights worldwide. So I'm not surprised at all when we see these positive correlations in the various indicators. Um, and I, I think um, sometimes there are artifacts of measurement that would make a country uh, do better on one or, or another when you look at, at the wide variety. But there are now 50 or 60 uh, different indexes studying various aspects of social well-being in countries around the world. I, I think the index of economic freedom sort of started a trend, if you will, uh, because people started to notice our results and, and others have followed suit. And I'm, I'm very proud of that development and I think it's very positive for, for
for all of us that are trying to understand better how our own country fits into a regional arrangement or the globalized system entirely. Um, how about way over here? We haven't had anyone from this side. Hi there, Steve Sass from Baltimore. I'm just uh, like some clarification on how your calculations really work. In this, as maybe one example, so the U.S. raised tariffs on China and a few other countries, but it didn't do anything, for instance, with a tariff to uh, Switzerland, or, and we did things with NAFTA. How do you balance that? And is it a, if a 20% tariff means more than a 10% or 8%? the number of countries, the volume. How do you do the calculations? Yeah. Um, we use the actual applied tariff rate, average applied tariff rate, the, the tariff rate that is actually paid um, at the border uh, by, uh, for on, on goods and services imported into the United States or any other country. In fact, that data is available from the World Bank uh, for almost all countries in the world. and. Um, I, I think it's the best representation. A lot of countries have tariff rates that aren't always necessarily applied. Sometimes they have very high statutory rates. Sometimes there are exceptions to that. Uh, but what we use in our calculations are the average applied tariff rates. Um, sometimes that indicator makes it a, the index a little slower to react to developments like the imposition by the United States of tariffs on particular countries. And of course, we because we actually have to see those tariffs being paid and applied um, on the goods, and then we'll pick that data up and it'll be reflected in our index. So, uh, for example, the United States only had a very small drop in trade freedom this year uh, because we were just beginning in the beginning stages of of seeing the application of those tariffs. If that continues, uh, there'll be a much bigger impact on the U.S. score next year. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jared Ling. I'm from TECRO, or the Taiwan representation in uh, the United States. And I'm uh, today I'm just pleased to see that uh, Taiwan has moved three places up from 13th of last year to 10th uh, this year. And uh, you know we are uh, grateful for this uh, the announcement. And the um, why well, uh, during today, you know, the presentation, you will convey a one message that uh, the uh, economic freedom leads to better uh, economic power, environment, education, and uh, uh, social well-being. And um, um, while well, you know, for us to live in a you know better life, you know, uh, economic power, economic. Uh, economic growth and, and uh, uh, democracy are two, are two uh, uh, major contributors to uh, you know, our, uh, our good life. And so uh, do you see uh, in the report or in your study the correlation between the economic freedom and the democracy? Uh, yes, we absolutely do, um, um, and we have published that data in some editions of our index. Um, the democracy indexes aren't necessarily updated on a regular basis, so we wait till we see some, some statistical change in that data, and then we do report that. Uh, we have seen um, a very high correlation between economic freedom and, the, um, and effective democratic governments. There are an awful lot of countries around the world that call themselves democratic, uh, sometimes even in the name of their, <coughs> of their country, uh, but don't really have uh, democratic practices or the ability for the peaceful transfer of power through democratic means. Um, but there are indexes now that measure truly effective democratic governance, and when we compare those with our rankings in um, the economic freedom, uh, we find that there's a very strong relationship. I'm not sure. I, I think it's mutually supportive, this relationship. I think having a truly effective democracy contributes to economic freedom, and I certainly think economic freedom contributes to the development of a, of a true democracy. Uh, Taiwan's done very well in our index, and um, your your government is to be commended for its actions. I think to to liberalize in um, uh, the economic regulations and and make it possible for your people to prosper in the way they have. Um, I guess we're just about out of time. Maybe one more question, uh, Barbara, down here in the front.
Thank you for your presentations. I'm Barbara Bowie Whitman, and I've spent more than five decades working for the Republican Party and a whole lot of years on trade issues as an economist and negotiating some trade agreements. One of my views on that is that we don't need trade agreements if we just let people trade the way they wanted to, but government should be out of it. But that's another topic for another whole day. What grabbed me today was how effective the talking parts are about economic freedom and why it produces the results we want in terms of people's liberty overall. And it sounded like the best political message I've ever heard. How do we translate that into practical politics in this country so that people understand it better instead of listening to how much good we can do for you with your own money if we take it first and redistribute it? Well, if we had the answer to that question, we'd put our, all ourselves out of business. <laughs> um, look, that's a big challenge of what we do. I mean, as, as purveyors of free market principles, we go up against an enemy who, A, is not, um, doesn't have to adhere to the truth, and they promise you everything. Um, and we have to say, just trust us. You, you know, take away the regulations, and you will end up in a better place. And you know, we spend a lot of time here at Heritage trying to figure out what, what's the way to communicate this, reaching out to people across the country. And you know, the, to me, the index is a really important tool in doing exactly that. And I can just tell you, as, as someone who has been, um, I've had the, the, the honor of leading our domestic economics um, team for a few years, one of the first things I did um, was try to really integrate the work that we do into the, the principles and messages that the index puts out there. Because by doing that, we're able to sort of build, I think, a cohesive argument that is more, that lends itself more easily to a policy agenda. So, you know, we're, I don't have the perfect answer, but we continue to, to, to work on that, to communicate it. And thank you very much for saying that we did an okay job with it here today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that'll have to be the last word. And uh, we would invite you all to join us out in the lobby for a uh, reception celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Index of Economic Freedom. Thank you for coming today.